Hello, and welcome to Gallery Works. We have a special treat for you today. We have glass artist, an award-winning, famous, internationally famous glass artist, Beth Lipman, with us today. Hello, Beth. Hi. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Thank Thanks you so for having much. Me. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's, yeah. a, it's a pleasure. Mm -hmm. And I am just, you know, I saw an article in the newspaper about you a few weeks ago, and I read it and I thought, who is this gal? I've got to meet this gal, you know, and the fact that she lives right here in, in you know, Sheboygan, where I live and mm -hmm. everything, you know, mm -hmm. and so then you were so gracious, you know, to set the date with me and everything, and then since then, to find out that you've won this huge award, a $50,000 grant, and you're one of 52 people out of how, what was it, like 2,000 or something it like that? It actually wasn't that many, but it was, it was about, it was a little over 300 people are nominated nationally, and then, um, and then those nominees apply, so you have to be nominated and apply if, mm -hmm. to be selected, so. That's, that's fabulous. That really is. It's pretty amazing. I'm still pinching myself. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, and I talked to you on the phone earlier, so I know you're a mommy. How do you, <laughs> how do you, how do you juggle all that? Yeah. Um, well, I actually, I have a super supportive husband. He is uh, the studio and business manager for my art. So we're working, we're both working full time, basically, in the studio. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't know, I wouldn't be able to do it without him. His name is Ken Sager. And um, so we split the days. Half the day I'm in the studio making my work, and then the other half of the day he is doing everything besides making the work. So mm -hmm. whether it's studio maintenance or packing and shipping or even making some components for the work. Um, and then whenever one of us is in the studio, the other one is with the kids because they're under three. So, oh. um, are they twins? I mean, yes. Um, so I'm sure once they start preschool, we'll have a different schedule. But that's yeah. what we've done for the last two and a half years. Yeah, you know? it'll be a little. It'll be a little bit easier once yeah. they start preschool. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can. I can just see that that could be a little, a little breathing area. Little times. breathing. Yeah. 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 And um, now tell me, how, how did you get started with, with this, um, this particular form of art? Uh-huh. Um, well, I went to art camp when I was 15, and I took a glass blowing class. It was called Horizons New England Craft Program. And um, I don't know, the, the process looked interesting to me at the time. I was a teenager. I was very... Uh, artistic growing up. My mother is uh, an artist and a craftsperson, so mm. it, th my parents were both very supportive of me looking towards the arts or practicing art when I was young. And when I said I wanted to go to this program, they were really enthusiastic and sent me there. Um, and there was a variety of different things being offered at that camp, and I just happened to choose uh, both glass blowing and also textiles. And that um, really kind of piqued my curiosity and I ended up going to art school for glass and fibers mm -hmm. afterwards so mm -hmm. um, and now the article that I read didn't mention anything about fiber work yeah. so uh, you you have drifted over to the to the glass <laughs> and and, and yeah. have stayed with that yeah yeah although I have to say I there's a lot of my process that I think is inherently more um, kind of aligned with a fiber process. The, mm -hmm. I, I make all of my work on, on uh, templates, brown pieces of paper that become templates, and that idea of kind of assembling a pattern mm -hmm. and um, constructing in that way from multiple parts is, is, a, is pretty I historically, see yeah. Yeah, I see. It's kind I, of historically I more of a fiber, fiber way of approaching making. So right. um, it's there. It's just kind of deeply embedded in the, the process. Yeah. yeah, and and you have um, uh, you have been at John Michael Kohler Art Center yes. mm -hmm. in residence, mm -hmm. right? Yes. And uh, was that once or twice? I it? was there in residence uh, in 2003 in the Pottery, mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it was really a life changing 
moment for me. That's how I ended up here in Sheboygan Falls because in 05, um, the position overseeing that residency program became available and I took that position and um, moved back here. Oh, really? So I worked as an arts administrator um, for over 10 years, essentially. I've uh -huh. only recently been practicing my work full time, so. Mm. Well, you have, you have done some really major things. Um, in the, the Norton Museum, mm -hmm. I believe, and, yeah. um, and many others. And, um, it, it, you know, tell, tell us a little bit about that. Uh, how, how do you, um, I mean, you know, I mean, the average person would have no idea. What happens? Does the museum call you up and oh, yeah. say, say, I saw something of yours? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I would, I would probably recommend that um, most artists don't contact a museum and say they want to do a commission. <laughs> As you know, Kitty, yes. <laughs> like it doesn't, doesn't really happen right in right. that way. But um, I, I was, um, so the new director at the Norton Museum of Art, Hope Allswang, was the director of the RISD Museum in 2008, and I was uh, invited to do um, an, an installation there at that time and when she left the RISD Museum and landed at the Norton Museum um, I, I just kind of kept in touch with her and she called me out of the blue and said oh we you know we'd love for you to do something we have an amazing still you know still life collection so the the process took probably over a year when it was all said and done of just having a dialogue visiting the site seeing what they had in the museum um, I have a, a primary, my primary gallery is Heller Gallery in New York. I also work mm -hmm. with Katie Tompkins projects in Rhode Island. So um, Heller Gallery uh, negotiated the contract. Mm -hmm. And um, and so, uh, you know, I had, I had kind of a general idea of what I thought I might do for them. But when I really actually visited the site last year, almost exactly a year ago, actually, I um, well, you know how inspiration comes. It's like right. this thing exactly. that almost gets channeled in from the outside or right. something. So right. I would, <clears throat> usually when I go to visit sites, when I'm looking to do something site-specific for someone, I, I almost feel like I have another sensory thing that's happening uh, that I just am open to. Uh, you know, I know that it I'm there for a focus. It needs. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So. And, and I've been fortunate in that I haven't le been left high and dry <laughs> to date, <laughs> that I usually get some understanding of what needs to happen right. when I visit that site. Um, that's it's, the same way, it's the same way with a painter. Yeah. Um, you yeah. know, there's a point where the canvas actually tells you what exactly. it needs. And if you, as long as you're open to that, yeah. you know, it, it's, it's, uh, it's, a, a, it's a deep sense of... of um, a, a connection, a spiritual connection mm -hmm. with with your work, you know, and the That's creative right. process That's right. that that makes that happen for you. It's really right. I know it's really wonderful. Yeah, it's it's hard to describe as well, but I think it just um, it takes a lot of solitary time. I think mm -hmm. a lot of a lot of puttering around as well, kind of allowing the problem to to. Um, percolate in the peripheral vision of what's going on in your life and um, it's like when you forget something and you can't remember it in that moment that you need it and then after um, a period of time it comes to you I think it's the same right exactly it's, it's yeah. inherent in the creative process I totally agree right so um, and I've been really fortunate in that the last several years in my work I've had many opportunities come to me that allow me to evolve and change as an artist and and I'm being given the opportunity to do this and and, and being compensated for it you know it's mm -hmm. not just yes, following yeah. my muse now I'm able I have thankfully a number of people that have responded to my work that are Giving you know, affording me the opportunity to kind of continue to create work. Right, and so now, so. now you're at that point where you where you really feel validated as an artist. I do, I do, especially yes. the last several years. I feel like okay, well, what I'm doing is worthwhile. And exactly. Certainly, getting the USA grant, um, United mm -hmm. States Artist Grant, um, it's a fellowship essentially. Um, 
It's just even more than the money, it's a form of validation that what you're doing matters, especially in um, living in this society where there's really not um, a lot of condonement from the government uh, that, you know, the arts matter or mm -hmm. anything like that, that it's really... Well, it's not, there's not... Uh, there's I, more private support than public support. Right. I, I feel so. that, I, I personally feel that, that things seem to be so impermanent. They, they, everything seems to be so, you know, in the moment that's like, you know, oh, well, that's so five minutes ago, you know, mm -hmm. or something like that, you know, I mean, it's, um, I don't know that, and that kind of bothers me, but I mm -hmm. think that really good art transcends that, mm -hmm. and, uh, that, and that's why it's important that the artists continue to create that really fine art, too, mm -hmm. tran transcend that, that throw away, um, you know, what's ever, whatever is, is the latest fad type mentality mm -hmm. that, that I think we as Americans, a lot of us have, you mm -hmm. know, so. mm -hmm. just my thoughts. No, but I, I think it's also, it is completely um, in keeping with the age of computers as well and social mm -hmm. networking and everything. Is everything is a nanosecond now, every yeah. single thing. Everything and is a, it just it moving so fast, yeah. right? Yeah, so I, I and, and when you make something, it is permanent. It does have a permanence. Right. Um, and we need that in this, yeah, in the fleetingness of life and and or in trends, as you said, that kind right. of thing. So, I agree. Now um, we have some pieces here okay. in front of us that you have brought. These are components, some components for an installation that you had at the studio, because because naturally your installations you can't bring them. In there, I could, but it would take a bit of time, <laughs> more than a half hour of time. Yeah, right. Yeah. But um, uh, can you just take these pieces sure. that you have on the table and move them around a little bit, sure. and just give us an idea of your thought process? You know, if you can verbalize that. Sure. I mean, I, I. Um, well, what I do is I amass objects like this. In, in my studio, um, they're made with a variety of different techniques. Sometimes I work with um, different people as well to create works. Um, so not only am I the one making components, but other, you know, other people help me. And I think that broadens my vocabulary actually in, in the making. So I amass a certain number of objects and then uh, I start to reduce, and I, I, like I said, I work on a on a table with a piece, of, you know, blank mm -hmm. piece of paper, and um, I will, uh, I'll just start to put together things that it's a very formal exercise. I, I try to um, arrange things in a way that um, begin to form a dialogue with the different objects. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's, I mean, it's a age-old <laughs> practice. The still life genre has been around since the early 1600s well, yeah, and even prior to that. Yeah. yeah, so, so um, and I also think that it is really in keeping with uh, our practice in the domestic realm as well, in, you know, the interior. It's very much about that nesting thing. So it might take me months to really um, resolve a composition, but I, I essentially uh, move things around a lot <laughs> in my studio practice. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll putter, I call it puttering around. I'll come in and I'll, you know, basically I'll listen to what the work needs and I'll, I'll just try to figure things out, see how they fit together, what the relationship is in between different objects is interesting to me. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. This kind of uh, opening that happens, and this is a broken, I use things that are broken as well. I, I'm I am essentially non-judgmental about the objects. So the mm -hmm. objects, mm -hmm. for me, are really kind of capturing a moment in time with whoever made those objects. Yes. So it is not in my place to, you know, take this object and say it's good or bad. It is an to object be that exists. Judgmental about it. Yeah. yeah. So I, there's a place for everything in my work. 
-hmm. And um, I basically f figure out where things are supposed to exist in relation to other things. So this is a broken goblet that I know is going to have, sorry, <laughs> um, exactly the right place in some composition. Mm -hmm. It's going to really, mm -hmm. um, it's going to Speak. click together into a puzzle in the way that it absolutely is ascent. You know exactly what I'm talking about, uh, obviously, because um, you also practice. So these are artichokes. These are solid sculpted. What I, what I do, what I will say about when I work is I do try to keep in mind very common, formal, um, parameters like mm -hmm. if, if something is heavy and solid I'll try to pair it with something that's lighter and more delicate mm -hmm. there needs to be height varying heights within the objects they need to relate to one another right. some well, things are very thin and delicate other things um, hold a different kind of weight so this is not my most ideal I, I, absolutely absolutely yeah. yeah so so for instance like this and, and I also try to play with almost the impossible like what happens if this knife were to be balanced within you know this bowl of bananas in some way so so the impossibility of the composition is also kind of important to me and that's also in keeping with the still life tradition where you're you're seeing perhaps objects on one table that would never have existed on one table during the 1600s. And for, you know, I think the parallel that I think about now <clears throat> in relation to that idea is just the amount of excess that we have in our lives and what we choose to collect and own and what it says about us mm -hmm. is all very interesting to me. So the work tends to be pretty excessive. So anyway, I could do this like the entire time, essentially. So I'll stop now. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, so it just, uh, yeah. I try to give myself enough time, whatever the deadline is, that I try to work backwards with enough time to know that uh, I need that time to, to have things come to me, mm -hmm. which is what we were just talking about. So... I, th I think it's just fascinating, and you, you must have a, a um, um, oh goodness, I'm not, I'm not <laughs> uh, a kiln and, mm -hmm. and, and, and blow mm -hmm. the glass, and, and, but the thing that I'm curious about is, the, the, do you ever work with colored glass? Oh, yeah. Um, I rarely do. I, I find, because I'm working in... Uh, historically decorative material to begin with that um, the color for me is a little bit too decorative actually okay and also when you add color even if it was a transparent color into the material it does change the way that your eye moves through the material mm -hmm. as well as having the material reflect back at you right it loses so it's, it's um Luminosity. Yeah, I think. there's there's something yeah. you know. For me, the clear is really the essence of the object. Yes. Or the essence of the idea. I do also work in black and occasionally white, but usually when I'm, the black is really kind of in keeping with Victorian decorative arts, mm -hmm. which I'm really quite interested in. Um, so, for me, that's a it's a very f more funerary or kind of a mourning decorative art yes. when I'm using yes. the black. It is heavily symbolic in that way. Although I will also say, in the Asian cultures, white is also a symbol of of mourning and death. Mm -hmm. So that's that's also very interesting in keeping with the still life tradition of Vanitas as well. So. Uh, so yeah, I don't really use color. I don't have a need for color. Um, I think that's marvelous. Yeah. I think that's marvelous. You're the, the only glass artist that, um, that I have ever seen that works with clear glass. You know, not that mm -hmm. I've seen that many, but you know, I know quite a few people that work with glass. And I just think that's marvelous. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can just, I think it's luscious. I'd like to show some photos uh, of uh, installations, of completed installations that okay. you've done, and have you tell us about them, okay? okay. Um, this first mm -hmm. one, um, mm -hmm. 
but can you tell us about yeah. that? <laughs> I, well, I just finished it a month ago. It's called One in Others, and it is a, a commission for the Norton Museum of Art. It's going to be installed at the end of January and be on view through the spring there. Um, and this, what you kind of can't see in the image, but uh, the, the piece is actually essentially sitting on a casket. Mm. So um, the casket is to my dimensions. Um, so it's, this is, I consider this a composite portrait between uh, myself, um, the Norton Museum and their permanent collection holdings because a lot of the objects found on, on this composition um, are in reference to a lot of the still life paintings in their collection. Oh. Additionally, the Norton Museum is built on a gr an early settler's grave site. Oh my. Mm -hmm. And there is a man um, in the basement that was a pineapple grower. So <laughs> the, the entire piece is, is covered <coughs> with pineapple plant parts. So it's, it's, that's the pervasive huh. kind of overall um, um, message. You? No, it's it's not a that. message. It's it's like a it's a um, it's a persona. No. Um, it's the thing that's consuming the composition. Okay. Okay. So, uh, yeah. It's so that's what that is. Yeah. It's beautiful. <laughs> and now this one here, this really touches me. I think this is just absolutely gorgeous. Oh, yeah. This is Picture with Vine. I also just completed this um, piece this year. And in fact, this is the shot from the back of this piece. You, you enter the piece from the front where the vine kind of just, just barely creeps over mm -hmm. uh, the front of the table. But it's um, several years ago, I started really studying kudzu vine and also the kudzu plant, which uh, many people know ha is growing invasively in this country mm -hmm. and um, so I, I'm interested in um, the the manifestation of kind of the natural imbalance or uh, or a moment of excess within nature that is somehow connecting with the still life which also talks about a certain abundance or excess or can not mm -hmm. everyone chooses to work in that way within the still life tradition, but that's something that has been a thread in my work for the last, you know, 12 years or something. Yeah. So okay. th at this point, these two, these two, uh, um, you know, ways of 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 being kind of imbalanced or or excessive in the world come together: the natural and the human made. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. Thank you. And this, this must be, now is this installed someplace, mm -hmm. right? It's in my barn right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But it will be installed actually in Oklahoma this coming summer. Wonderful. Um, yeah, the Oklahoma Museum of Art in Oklahoma City. And uh, Bride is a piece I made last year. And um, what you kind of maybe can't tell from the image, but essentially, there is a, a certain amount of order and formality at the very top of the work, and then it kind of uh, descends into chaos towards towards the bottom of the work. So it's beautiful, yeah, beautiful. And now this this one is of the black glass that you were talking about right. earlier. Yeah, this is candlesticks, um, books, flowers, and fruit. And this piece actually is going to the De Young Museum. They just recently acquired it. And in where is that? San Francisco. Wonderful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So oh, that's marvelous. Yeah, I'm very excited about it. Actually, yes. how yeah. many museums are you in? Uh, I don't. Uh, I don't know. Um, not not so many that I can, I've lost count. Yeah, but, but I, I don't but know. Quite a few. Yeah, I right. would say maybe. Um, you know, maybe t ten to fifteen. That's marvelous. Yes, yeah. and yeah. and uh, uh, and uh, out of the United States also, right? Yeah, there I've had exhibitions outside of the United okay. States, um, and some of my work is is 
in private collections abroad, but sure. there's no uh, permanent collections outside of the states that I'm aware of, <laughs> that okay. I'm thinking of yeah. at this point. Yeah, oh, sure. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And now this one, this is one of my favorites right here. Oh, I yeah. love this composition. Oh, yeah. Yeah, this, this is called Candlesticks. Now, this is um, a print on plexiglass. Mm -hmm. So in 2007, I started uh, creating compositions for photographs. And so I'd create the composition. Um, I work with a photographer, Rob Quinn, who is basically my, my hand. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he, and um, we take photographs. And, uh, and then I destroy the composition. So I'll either destroy oh. or recycle the glass oh, within it. Oh, OK. So th there's, there are additions of eight. Oh, OK, yeah. OK. Well, that's a little different then. The, yeah. uh, the, yeah. the print on the, on the plexiglass, yeah. that's, that's a uh, rather unique approach, I think. Yeah, yeah. You know, I don't know what, of what gave you that idea. Um, you know, it's one of those things, once again, I was sitting in dialogue with a curator about one of my pieces, and it was, um, we were looking at the photograph and admiring the photograph, and I kind of had this aha moment. Oh my God, it would be amazing to just do compositions mm -hmm. for photographs, mm -hmm. and then, so, and the, I do, I have those like aha moments every couple of years, <laughs> <laughs> you know. A year, year or two might go by, and then, oh, oh my God, I could do, you know, this is important. And then I, then I just like, you know, then it's just the perseverance, the oh. tenacity to keep kind of exploring those ideas. So, and, and we're almost out of time. Real quick, where is your next installation going to be? Oh, okay. Um, well, it would be at the Norton Museum. Um, one and Others is the very next one. Okay. Um, and then also that following that is Art Palm Beach, with, which is an art fair. Okay. So my work will be on view there as well. Oh, yeah. that's, uh, and you also have something at the Milwaukee Art Museum right now, right? Yeah, I do, actually. That's, that is up as we speak. It's called The Tool at Hand. And, and how long is that going to be there? I believe it's going to be there through April. Marvelous. Yeah. I'm going to see it. I tell you, all of you, go down into the Milwaukee Art Museum and see this woman's work. It's just fabulous. If you could just see it and look at it up close, you'd be amazed. Once again, thank you. I thank you so much thank for being you. on the show. And so this is Kitty Lynn Klisch for Gallery Works. We've been in the studio today with Beth Lipman, glass artist extraordinaire. Don't miss the next show because it'll be another great one. Bye-bye for now. Thank you.